Hello and welcome to Cold Outreach Success Stories, where we interview regular business people just like you who had great success with Cold Outreach on email and other channels. We go deep into the process with hot tips around targeting, messaging, personalization, so that you can take away tips to implement in your Cold Outreach starting tomorrow. Today, we have Josh from Founderscale. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so let's get into it. What does what does your company do and how do you guys make money? Sure. So Founderscale focuses on helping founders go from founder revenue to scalable revenue. So uh, that's really a challenging journey. Uh, a lot of founders, you know, find through through the course of business that it's hard to go from being the person generating that the majority of the revenue for the organization and really getting out from under that. So they may they may generate ninety to one hundred percent now, and they just want to get that down to fifty, or they want to get that down to zero, while also uh, ensuring the company is continues to grow. And that journey is really challenging. And a lot of founders look out and see like, oh, well, all these other companies have done it. There's a path. And I was like, there is a path, but it's it's a complicated one. So we guide them through that path. Interesting. Interesting. So what kind of companies do you work with? Is, is it mostly tech or do you um, you know work with all kinds of companies? Yeah. So it's a, a broad group of companies. I would say most of them are about two to 20 million in revenue. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them are a founder who have been in business uh, usually five or more years. So mm -hmm. they have gone through the journey. They have tried different sales and marketing techniques to try and scale up. And usually they've gotten to a point where, you know, revenue is is the growth and revenue is slow, a lot slower than they want it to be. And they're willing to look at a different model and see, okay, how does, how does founder scale do it? How do they take us along this journey? Interesting. Interesting. So, so give me, give me maybe an example of a client that's worked with you. Obviously don't name the company, but where they were before they started working with you, what kind of, you know, um, what, what does the process look like in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. So we had, for example, an IT company and uh, the founder had seven salespeople. And you would think with seven salespeople, that group would be generating a majority of the revenue, but that still wasn't the case. They're they're doing their job, you know, they're they're providing and, and holding their own, but the biggest deals and a lot of the best deals were still coming in through the founder. And mm -hmm. so what we were able to do is go in and look at what they were doing, how they were doing it, and really amplify it. So there's different um, just challenges you get into as a founder. If you haven't managed a sales team before, what are the techniques that are used? What are ways that you can amplify the output of a salesperson instead of just hiring another one? And with technology, there's lots of ways to do that today. Uh, so we were really able to amplify what all seven of those salespeople were doing with certain demand generation techniques and uh, help them start to generate more of that revenue proportionally. Interesting. Interesting. So um, let's go deeper into your process now for finding clients. How do you yeah. guys find clients? Is it mostly referrals or do you have your own? Do you sort of eat your own dog food in that sense? Yeah. So we do eat our own dog food in that sense. We we call it drinking our own champagne since I don't eat dog food. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to switch that up. That's so good. yeah. That's good, we, yeah. Yeah. We drink our own champagne. So we run uh, Part of that process of going from founder revenue to scalable revenue is we use what's called demand generation. And that's mm -hmm. to educate and engage clients before you try and convert and close. Mm -hmm. And so during that engage and educate, we're using list building. Uh, we are going out and building those lists of people and figuring out how can we engage with them on an ongoing basis and not just try to convert and close somebody that's cold that we never, that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, so there's a couple pieces of that process. Uh, some are that list building for demand generation. A lot of them are also following up on the types of engagements that we can leverage like a networking group. So we'll find that people you know, want to do this cold thing over here, but they've actually been involved in a great networking group for five years mm -hmm. and they've never gone out and got that list and said, hey, we're in the same group why don't we go to lunch, you know? And so what we find is the warmer the engagement and the more connections they have geographically, by industry, by even by like groups that they're in, the better conversion rate we get on, you know, them being able to engage those people. So we've really just kind of honed in on the different techniques that work versus the ones that are a little more far-fetched. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. I mean, the warmer you are, 
the less of cold outreach it will be right like the right the, the goal is always to make it less cold right yeah and that's what we see a lot of is the owner of a business will e- either them or they'll hire somebody and immediately they go to cold outreach let's mm-hmm. go buy a list reach out to a bunch of people who have never met us before and ask for a meeting. We call it the contact and pitch. And that's like, what we see is that is actually the lowest converting model you can do, right? You're sending, uh, we see it's generally about 10 to one. So for every 10 activities, maybe you get one response and that that's not even counting whether it's a positive or negative response. That's just to get a response, you know? So it's 10 to one on cold, but most companies have all these other much warmer networks that they can leverage. And so we can use the same techniques in a different way. And what we see is the closer you move to a warmer, we've been able to get it to more of like five to one and more of those, you know, five outreach or touch points to get one response. And that one response is normally more positive on average. So there's just different techniques we can use to get away from that, that just purely cold nature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I 100% agree. It's, I mean, you're doing a lot of marketing activities organically right like without yeah. the, you know the whole um like the whole pressure to generate a lead and then those activities if you're just marrying them um, neatly into cold outreach then suddenly it's no longer cold outreach right and that's where the conversion rates go up right exactly awesome so let's go deeper into that uh what does your cold outreach process look like in that sense right once you identified okay this is a network that we can reach out to what channels do you use it is mostly email is it linkedin do you do cold calling what does that cadence look like yeah i would say it's mostly email and linkedin for us and for our clients um mm-hmm. it's a kind of a just an easier to use channel some also layer in uh depending on the type of company the layer in calls and text and so that's one of those things where it just depends on kind of the structure. If somebody's a, a BDR, SDR, you know, if it's more B2B or B2C, you know, that's one of the interesting things. B2C, it seems a lot more common and acceptable to layer in SMS mm-hmm. into that. Whereas in B2B, it just seems to be a little more of a, uh, a little more frowned upon, right, in the business community to to reach out in that way for business for B2B engagement. So yeah, so we try to use whatever channel is best for that organization, but I would say a lot of email, a lot of LinkedIn. God, it makes a ton of sense. Perfect. So let's go deeper into the copy. Um, yeah. How do you think through that whole process of copywriting? Yeah, so copy is an interesting one where we really think about it as what are the three to four sentences mm-hmm. that can get their attention and give them a reason to engage with us. So again, we, we're not big believers in the con- connect and pitch, right? Like, hey, here's all about us. And there's these really long sentences that tell you all about our company. And then we're going to pitch you for a meeting, but we've never met you. Just yeah. doesn't seem to, the, the volume, maybe, maybe it used to work. I would say I'm still skeptical as if it used to work. Like I think people got lucky more than yeah. anything. It, um, and we're trying to build scalable revenue. So luck isn't really a part of that. It's just something that you might get. Um, so when we're looking at it, our pitch at the end is a reason to engage with us. So it's an invite to, it could be an invite to a webinar. If it's Uh local, we like to get hyper local when we can and invite people to events or Uh ask if they're going to be at the conference. So we're Uh trying to leave a little more open-ended question to see if they can engage and if we can start to build on that relationship with that person. So that Uh copy is usually around four sentences um and very very short and detailed and so we're always working through what works in that perspective interesting i think webinars is a very good point from that perspective right because if you're just inviting somebody to a meeting the call to action is very harsh in that sense yes. right? like, yeah expect a lot of them while if it's a webinar there's other people on there you might get to learn something it might be a group thing so yeah i think that's a very yeah. interesting tactic. so our heavy focus like We don't want to say, I don't know you, I'm reaching out and I want something from you like your time in a meeting. It's just not like you wouldn't walk up to somebody randomly at a networking event and be like, hey, my name's Josh with Founderscale and here's what we do. And do you want to get lunch? Right. And not even let them respond. That's essentially what you're doing, right? You're, you're, you're 
taking out normal behavior and trying to just pitch them. So when we do it, our copy is really about what can we give them? Mm -hmm. And that's that reason to engage. And so what we find is if we approach them and say something like, you know, I would love to meet you at this local event. Are you going to be there? Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, no, I'm not going to be there. But I looked at your website and maybe we can get coffee sometime. Like they'll inversely ask you, depending yeah. on how how much you've warmed it up or or whatever else it might be. Um, the other interesting thing we find is we call them, we look for low friction reasons to engage. Mm-hmm. So I would say asking somebody for a meeting that you never met is very high friction. Correct. If you're just asking them, if you're going to somebody and saying, hey, I see that you're in this industry. We have a newsletter that is specifically for people in that industry that I think is going to be helpful for you. And it's just educational content. Would you like to, would you like to join that? They're Mm -hmm. like, sure, send me the copy. And what we see is our conversion rates are way higher on asking people to join very niche newsletters. Now, keep in mind, this isn't like your, uh, your, your personal company newsletter about your new hires and whatever it's industry it's focused you know, it's educational, it's to help them. So it's providing them value. And what we see is the conversion rates are higher. And now I have an opted in list that I can work from and somebody who's seeing our information on a monthly basis. So all those different things compound to just provide a better experience for the prospect than just Mm -hmm. connecting and pitching or contacting and pitching them. Interesting. And that's a very, that is, yeah. (laughs) That's a very neat hack to get your name repeated in front of them, right? It's just about them seeing the founder scale name monthly. Yeah. And then you're reaching out, let's say six months later, and they're, they're already warmed up by uh, your, you know, um, yeah. great content. It's not like random newsletters. It's like actually good content for them. Yeah. And that's the key. It can't be just a random newsletter. So when we do it, and I think this goes to kind of one of your questions on like how we build our list and the messaging yeah. and the copy, you know, if we're building a list, we're normally, we're looking at what newsletter content we're writing and we're building the list of the ideal client we have in an Mm -hmm. industry vertical where we can provide them value. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're providing them value during the outreach, the conversion rates go up, right? It's everybody that just wants to go for, they just want to do the quick sale, give me a sale. And I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't really work that way, you know, especially in the B for B2B and the higher the price point and the higher the title and the bigger the company, the harder that gets. Um, So, yeah, so we have that, like you said, the monthly touch points with the newsletter is a big piece of that. And then you can start to layer in more. So Mm -hmm. instead of just running a 90 day campaign and trying to get, quote, leads, right, no matter how good or bad they are, we're really just trying to engage the prospect over a period of time Mm -hmm. so that when they have a problem, they think of us first. Yeah. So, you know, we've stayed in front of them with newsletters. We may also do another campaign to invite them to an industry survey. Well, now they're seeing us again and they're taking part in the survey and they Mm -hmm. want to see the results of the survey when we produce, you know, the content and we get a lead magnet. Mm -hmm. So there's just lots of ways that doing it, you know, in the way that we do provides content, reasons to engage, better conversion than just Mm -hmm. reaching out to somebody to ask for a meeting. Interesting. So the survey is a great point, right? Because that establishes you as a, you know, authority in that space as well, who's providing such good you know, uh, data, right? Like not just content, real data. Yeah. And it's great because I mean, you know, it starts for us, it starts to compound, right? You've been on the, you've been on, maybe you've been on the newsletter. uh, You filled out the survey. We've engaged multiple ways. Now we're going to have a webinar to talk about the survey results in your industry. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're going to hear from other people on a panel, you know, and you were one of the people that filled that in, right? So again, you're, the prospect is constantly getting value and we're Mm -hmm. at the center of that value as an industry expert. And Mm -hmm. that's the way we see that as scalable revenue, you Mm -hmm. know, sending out lots of high volume emails to try and convert somebody to a meeting right now. I don't really see that as scalable. I see that as a lot of you'll you'll hit every once in a while, you'll hit one, Mm -hmm. but there's other reasons that that's not scalable based on people and, and some habits that we'll talk about later, you know, in this podcast or some uh, misconceptions and things like that. Makes, makes a ton of sense. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, right? Cold outreach is, it seems like a very impatient tactic, right? Like um, right. people are not really 
considering that you're pissing off a lot of your market as well. It's not just about the 3% to respond. The other 97% now have a certain image of you, right? And then right. you have to work extra hard to undo that if you ever adopt, you know, a softer, um, you know, uh, cold outreach process later, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's lots of reasons why there's there's better ways that take a little longer than like like you said it's an impatient way mm -hmm. uh i call it the lead generation dream like oh. that's my moniker for it is the lead generation dream where they're like i'm going to hire a person and they're going to do all this outbound and they're just going to generate leads and we're going to close deals and i'm like huh has that ever worked for your company and they're like no we've never tried it like how did you build your company oh through networking and like building relationships i'm like huh okay <laughs> well there's ways to use those tactics yeah. to scale up relationship building, but yeah. jumping all the way to cold is generally not the way that works. And I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, content out there that says it works, but um, we like with the founders we work with, normally they've tried two or three companies, maybe four companies trying the lead generation dream. And yeah. we say, when you're done trying that, come call us because we're looking more at nine to 12 months of road of, of runway. But during that, you're going to have amazing content, reasons to engage events. You're going to have all these other things besides a campaign that just didn't work and went away, mm -hmm. you know, like you would if you did a 90 day cold outreach campaign. So mm -hmm. there's just, I think it takes a different type of founder or one that's already spent a lot of money trying the others and is now willing to look at it and go, okay, maybe this does take nine to 12 months to do this in the right way. And I can't just hack this in 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like when you wake up from the lead generation dream, then call us. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. On to my next question. Um, so what mistakes did you make when you first started with this whole thing? Yeah. So I think there was some mistakes that um, I, I would say it's common mistakes we've seen where people have come to us. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them may have been ours early on, but luckily some of them deal with email and we have some email deliverability experts on our team. So we were warned ahead of time and didn't have to make these mistakes. One I would say is using your primary domain for outbound email. Yeah. Like a lot of companies that come to us that went to other vendors you know, to do cold outreach, they paid the lowest company they could or the cheapest company or didn't ask or didn't know to ask, unfortunately, right? That's part of it. And they use their primary domain for all of these outreach. And all of a sudden, at some point, their, you know, their salespeople are sending out or their founders sending out quotes that are never getting delivered. And they're like, all of a sudden in the spam box. Mm -hmm. So, by using your primary domain for business development, and especially when you're getting into higher volumes, you can really trash your primary domain and end up where nothing's getting delivered. And yeah. what a lot of people don't know is there is no quick fix for that. Yeah. It's It could take nine to 12 months to fix a deliverability issue. There's nobody you call. There's mm -hmm. big giant MSPs, mail service providers that dictate the rules. You yeah. know, you're not calling a support team and, and just getting your email deliverability fixed. Yeah. Um, and that's one uh, big mistake we see a lot of people make and, and they hire companies to do this um, in very in, in very bad ways that have a lot of negative outcomes. Um, I would say another one that we started doing a long time ago and, and for our clients is we run all lists through validate email validation uh, mm -hmm. services and tools. So for example, what we see is like list providers, let's say you're buying a list or you're building a list, list providers will say something like, well, listen, we guarantee a 90% deliverability rate. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, here's what they're not telling you. The mail service providers, if you have a higher than 1% bounce rate, yeah. you're, you're way over the limits that they put in as an industry and they don't care what it's for, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, but Josh, we're doing, no. Nope. They don't care. They just look at you're delivering an email. 1% bounce rate or less is the industry standard. So right. by buying a list that guarantees 90% deliverability and blasting out through that immediately will probably mess up your domain, put you in the spam box, other things like that. So right. I think a lot of the, the most common mistakes we see, uh, especially on the email side, are dealing with email deliverability and why you do it in a more methodical way and why that can take longer. 
So an example would on that would also be like not adhering to what we call channel limits. Mm -hmm. So email from one person to another for like business development has a limit. So mm -hmm. we'll see people buy a 10,000 person list and blast that list. And, and then they're like, why is none of my email deliverable anymore? I'm like, well, it doesn't work that way. MSPs yeah. have algorithms. They start blocking you. Mm -hmm. So there's limits. So for example, same on LinkedIn. If you start sending a lot of outbound and you don't throttle your LinkedIn outbound, then LinkedIn is going to flag you and that you will get a notification talking about canceling your account, right? Yeah. They'll shut it off. So there's this weird misconception, like I'm just going to go spend a bunch of money, buy this big list. I'm going to send this big blast and we're going to get leads. Yeah. And there's just so many things that are wrong with that, that will trash your domain, your reputation, get you kicked off platforms. I mean, most platforms won't even allow you to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's these channel limits, I think is a common one um, that come into play as well. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I mean, this is one mistake that I made when I was starting out about like five or six years ago, bought a brand new domain, set up my email on it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to blast out like 500 emails a day. <laughs> right. And the very next day, I get a notification from Google saying, hey, your administrator account has been suspended. I'm like, okay, interesting. And that's when I started learning about this whole burner domains and then multi-inbox setup, like never using a single domain. You know, even if it's not your main domain, even then you need to use multiple domains to scale up, right? And you should have maximum of two inboxes per domain. So it's it's a whole thing now. But yeah, when I, yeah. When I was getting out, it was a common mistake. Like I made it yeah, I think that's another, you know, common mistake is people think just because they can buy a list and write an email that that that's the easy like sending it's the easy part. And it's actually all the prep work. Like we had a prospect one time and they're like, "Well, Josh, you know, if uh if this works, why don't I just why don't I just have my admin send all these emails?" I was like, "Because literally clicking the send button is the easiest part. Like using the tool to blast something else is the easiest part." It's all the copy. It's knowing what not to do to trash your entire domain. It's knowing that once you sent that, what do you want to follow up with? Are there reasons to engage instead of just cold outreach? You yeah. know, there's a lot of sophistication behind it to do it well. And it doesn't really have to do with crafting one email and hitting send, you know, a hundred times. It's just not the way it works. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. I think that's one of the reasons why we do this podcast series because this is, I think, the seventh time that someone has mentioned this are in like 15 episodes this season. So pretty high hit oh, rate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty high hit rate. Okay, so on to my final question. So what are some of the things you're excited about trying to improve your whole process? Um, I would say one of the things we're excited to do is learn how to chain emails a little better. So here's kind of another one of those things that people do that we find interesting is they buy the list they do the contact and pitch method, right? So they just blast them and ask for a meeting and then whatever they get out of it, they get out of it. And, and we, of course, take a fundamentally different approach. Our goal is we're spending a lot of time on a list and the content and the reasons people would want to engage with our brand and how we can really help them so that we can be at the forefront, you know, as an industry leader and be known for reaching out for a different, for a different thing, right? Other than just asking for a meeting. And so what that means is we're trying to stay in front of people at least monthly, but mm -hmm. or, or monthly, but at a minimum of quarterly. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is we're going through a multi-touch point campaign to maybe get somebody on a newsletter. We're doing like an opt-in campaign. And then we're going through a uh, the next quarter, we may be inviting them to a webinar on the same style or industry of topic, right? The next one, we may be doing a survey. So every quarter we're doing these campaigns in order to provide them value. And so I think the, the next thing we're really looking at is how do you chain those along the way and mm -hmm. really stay in front of people and manage multiple, multiple demand generation programs at one time? Because the logistics get really complicated. Right. You know, it's one thing just to buy a list, blast, buy a new list, blast. And we're like, well, you bought that list and you blasted them, nothing happened and you never went back to them. Like the target audience didn't change. Why would you not want to stay in front of them? Yeah. So we're really, we look at, you know, building the list and how do we stay in front of them in perpetuity and provide value. And that mm -hmm. just takes a lot of logistics and a lot of planning. So I think that's the thing we're most excited about working on over the next year is 
how do we handle the logistics and planning almost to where uh, we use HubSpot. We're a HubSpot certified partner and that's what we use for most of our clients. But um, we're looking at like ways to tag somebody and say, this person is somebody we want to stay in touch with. They're going to get this campaign, then this campaign, then this campaign, then this campaign. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to stay in front of them. And when we're talking about campaigns, it's almost a BD campaign, right? We're doing email and LinkedIn outreach, but with more of a, a, a little bit of a marketing flair, right? Because we're inviting them to something that marketing's putting together. So we're mm -hmm. combining those two. And that's that's a challenge. So I, I would say that's the that's the one challenge if we can... We can really um, stay in front of people better long term and and in a more sophisticated way with less work uh, if we can make that happen. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely a logistical challenge. Um, thinking about front of mind, have you thought of or ever tried like retargeting ads because you have their emails, right? Like you can possibly show them. Oh, yeah. you, you do that as well. Yeah. So we like, um, I don't know. I'd love to hear what you use, but we use AdRoll. And mm -hmm. so when people come to the site, we're retargeting them with whatever email we're sending. So for example, like we, we call it a warm up, or, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I guess in a, like a military sense, cover fire. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's the best example to use, but you know, it's cover. I it's, you know, I, yeah, I, okay. use, I use the exact <laughs> example. It's like air cover before you're sending an infantry. Exactly. So, yeah. so before we, when we build the list, we'll actually try and do targeted ads to just that list. Uh -huh. for the newsletter and right. then we're sending an email to get them on or we're or targeting them with the webinar and then if they if they go to the site then we're obviously retargeting as well right. um so when we look at ads in our space especially for like sub 20 million dollar companies we're in, in the b2b space we don't see ads really work from a conversion perspective mm -hmm. um what we do see is it works from an engagement perspective like it's keeping your brand in front of them and, you know, it can add to um, the name recognition so that they've seen your name. So I'm perfectly happy just putting a big founder scale banner in front of somebody for 14 days before we send an email, because then they recognize the name or, or should have some recognition of the name if they saw that banner. So I think there's other little tactics that help add on to that BD outreach. Mm -hmm. Got it. Interesting. That's interesting. I think that's it from my end. I think yeah. this was a really educational podcast and um, and I loved having you on. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. So that's all the time we have, folks. Um, I really enjoyed the episode. I hope you did too. Please subscribe, like, share, comment, whatever you can to spread the word out about Cold Audit Success Stories so more people can enjoy and learn from the show. All right. That's all, folks. Bye-bye.